The Syro-Ephraimite War, or Syro-Ephraimite Crisis, was one of four massive events that shook Jerusalem to its core during Isaiah's life, with many of his prophetic messages significantly being linked to this and the other three crises. This war-slash-crisis, which occurred in 735-734-732 BCE, began when the northern kingdom of Israel joined forces with the nation of Aram and waged war on Judah. Both Israel and Aram were vassal states of Assyria at the time. As the Assyrians spread their empire westward toward the Mediterranean and into Palestine, smaller Syrian and Palestinian states formed an alliance against Assyria to stop its expansion as their predecessors had successfully done in the previous century. Israel and Aram were among these alliance states. It seems that they both wanted Judah to rebel along with them, but Judah was not an Assyrian vassal at the time and understandably declined to join the revolt. Judah's refusal to join the alliance not only weakened the alliance, but would have given it a serious liability on its rear periphery. As a result, the alliance states attacked Judah in an effort to remove this liability and force its participation. My summary of the biblical account from 2 Kings 16, 5 through 9. Rezin, Aram, and Pekah, Israel, tried to conquer Ahaz, Judah. Ahaz called out for help from Tiglath-Pileser, Assyria, and plied him with temple and palace treasures. Tiglath-Pileser sent help, took over Damascus, and killed Rezin. Clearly, Aram and Israel's attempt to conquer Judah failed due to the greater power of Assyria. In 731, Tiglath-Pileser III campaigned to Syria-Palestine and crushed the coalition resistance. Judah's request for help from Assyria meant that Ahaz voluntarily became a vassal of Assyria, journeying to Damascus to submit to the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III. The especially famous prediction for Christianity that was spoken by Isaiah to King Ahaz in this historical context is in Isaiah chapter 7. The context is this Syro-Ephraimite war. Isaiah 7.2 tells us that when the house of David heard that Aram had allied itself with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. The Lord spoke several things to Ahaz through Isaiah, including Isaiah 7.13-17. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring on you and your people and on your ancestral house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Verse 14 is the verse around which much debate has swirled, primarily because it is quoted in Matthew 1, 22-23. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Jacobson and Chan tell us that the New Testament authors frequently interpret Jesus' existence as the messianic fulfillment of Old Testament promises, including this specific prophecy. This has continued throughout church history as Christians have perceived the work of Christ in the words of Isaiah. 
Jacobson and Chan add that it is also important to understand that the Old Testament was a true word of God to Israel in its own time, quite apart from the later Christian understanding that Jesus was the Messiah, leading us to realize that two things can be true at the same time. The primary debate can be settled by understanding that it is simultaneously true that this prophecy had deep significance for Israel, and we can recognize Jesus' messianic ministry in that same text. Jacobson and Chan aptly describe this as having dual hermeneutical horizons, which attest to the potency of the Old Testament tradition and to its flexibility and resiliency in the face of changing circumstances. That brings to mind an imagined argument between two young children about the best purpose for a toy shovel. It's only good for digging. No, it's also good for smoothing out. Then mom or dad comes along and shows that the shovel can be used well for both purposes. The children's eyes grow bigger as they each now realize more possibilities for their creative play that neither had envisioned before. Would that this kind of thing will happen in theological circles. Analogies involving children often help me to understand deeper truths.